This week's episode of the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast is driven by Cornerstone Gundog Academy. Cornerstone is the world's most comprehensive online gundog training resource. They've got over 160 instructional videos, including everything you need to take a seven-week-old puppy to a finished gundog. Visit cornerstonegundogacademy.com to sign up for their free preview module and begin your training journey today. Cornerstone Gundog Academy, the world's most advanced gun dog training resource on the web. You are listening to the HP Outdoors Waterfowl Podcast, episode 127. on the show we're talking shotgunning we've got don curry from the academy of wing and clay shooting and the chief instructor the national sporting clubs association joining us to give us some tips and techniques so that we're more successful this year in the field all right welcome to this the 127th episode of the hp outdoors waterfowl podcast i'm your host josh palm and we're your on-demand audio source for all things waterfowl and waterfowl hunting Check us out at hpoutdoors.com. You can find our show wherever quality podcast content can be found. iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, Google Play Store, all the great spots is where you can find our show. Catch us on all the social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you're a Facebook user, head over to our Facebook listeners group and join in with a bunch of like-minded waterfowl hunters, talking shop, and also talking with my co-host, Dan Harushka. Dan, what's up, man? Dude, I got a good Dan's just the tip of the week this week. Okay. Not so much a tip, but another uh, info nugget for you. All right. So, ducks can close one eye and put half their brain to sleep. And it says alligators, ospreys, bald eagles. There's a lot of critters out there that would like to make a meal out of a duck besides us hunters, correct? One way ducks have adapted to get some good shut eye while still keeping a lookout for potential danger is to close one eye in order to put half their brain to sleep while keeping the other eye open and the other half of their brain awake and alert. That is actually very interesting. Don't think I knew that. Very cool, though. There you go. How about it? Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, I'm okay, not so much a tip, but yet it's the tip of the, just the tip segment. So very, very interesting. Um, also interesting is Gunner Kennels, engineered for your dog, designed for travel and built for your peace of mind. The G1 Kennel has set a new industry standard and put the Gunner Kennel in a category all its own. Gunner started to protect your pet, and it continues to be the everything. <laughs> continues to be the center of everything that they do, and they're dedicated to building the best and safest pet travel crate on the market. Because man's best friend deserves man's best kennel. Check out their G1 series of kennels and accessories at GunnerKennels.com. Got a three-month-old baby at home. Can you tell? Also, 737 Duck and Goose calls. Original design, select grade components, superior sound, and unparalleled service. 737 takes exceptional pride in producing the finest quality, best-built premium calls on the market today. They're made in America, and they're offered only direct to consumers through their website. Shipping's always free, and international orders are also now accepted online. 20-day money-back guarantee and a lifetime warranty accompany every call purchased. 737 Duck Calls lead the flock. All right, Dan. So I think I probably should ask how your trip to Bermuda went. This is probably your first time away from all the kids since you've had all three. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Bahamas. But yes, it was the first time. What did, well, what now, did I say? Kids, what did I say? Did I not say Ber- Bahamas? B- Bermuda. Oh, sorry. Bermuda, Bahama. Come on, pretty mom. No, but um, yes. The, no. So they have they have stayed over at... Um, grandpa's house for a night and my aunt's house for a night, but we usually pick them up at like six thirty. So to be gone for whatever it was, four nights was a stretch, but it was much needed. It was our ten year anniversary trip, so um, it was fun, man. A lot of fun. Went down. I saw absolutely no waterfowl whatsoever. Tons of doves and pigeons and other little birds, but. Nothing really to you report guys, back on were, a waterfowl front. Were you guys more the adventurous, get out and do excursions types, or were you the more lay on the beach and throw back Limerita type? Um. So, <laughs> <laughs> it was. We actually did quite a bit. Um, the first day, Coco K, 
uh, it was really beautiful. So the wife wanted to get her day on the beach in. So I had snorkel gear and was swimming all over the place. And it was really neat. There's some planes, uh, crash planes and some cannons and stuff that I swam around. And, uh, and then the second day we went into Nassau and went on a sailing excursion where they stopped at a reef and you could either drink limeritas or, you know, go explore the, the reef. So we did both of those and, and then came back. So it was, it was really cool. You want to know something that was crazy? Michael Jordan has a house down there and he has, I, I have no idea how much it is worth. I think the lots go for like five million, at least next to Oprah they do. But um, he has a do- a two story dog house huh. that is just huge for when he takes his dog. I don't know what kind of dogs, but uh, definitely he treats his animals right. So uh, a lot of cool things, but yeah, definitely we were spent a lot of the time in the clear water. That's the clearest water I've ever been in, and it was. It's just a good time. Good good time to get away and and then we're supposed to get two inches of snow tomorrow, so back to reality. Yeah, it seems like um the weather this year has been you know, it's obviously been crazy, but spring is just not I mean, the winter's just not letting go. Uh, you know, no. we've you know, you're seeing snowstorms all over the place. You're seeing uh, you know, March is cool. definitely uh coming in like a lion or whatever they call it. I mean, Nebraska is just a tragedy what's going on out there with the flooding that they're dealing with and you know we had uh you know a ton of rain here today you know locally where i live so it just seems like the weather is just kicking us while we're down at this point and you know i am i am probably in the first time in my life maybe actually pretty excited for just hot weather and like baseball and just summertime i'm ready to just dry out a little bit and you know uh, have some have some warm weather but uh yeah, definitely uh, thoughts and prayers to everyone in the Midwest. Like, it's, there's towns getting washed away, like houses yep. completely underwater. And, yep. I mean, that's just, that's awful. Mm-hmm. You know, everything that they put their money into, and that's their life, and it just swept away with, it's, it's just incredible, the power of Mother Nature. It's unreal. Yep, Mother Nature always reminds us she's undefeated, unfortunately. So. Yep. Uh, you know, prayers for them out there, and hopefully, uh, you know, that gets, you know, hopefully it doesn't continue to get worse and something they can start to rebuild, you know, sooner rather than later. Right. Um, I, I do want to say um, our local lakes right now are absolutely flooded with ducks. Like yeah. every every single species you could imagine. And they're, I mean, the entire lake is just covered with them. Mm. So it's definitely... Uh, one of the good things I do look forward to after season is watching all the birds come back through and just, you know, just not pressured at all. And yeah, it's funny because there's that little, uh, little park at Conneaut Lake now that you can walk around the ice house park or whatever it is. And they, put, <laughs> there's been so many geese there pooping everywhere that they put a owl decoy <laughs> in the middle, in the middle of it. And, there's no geese on the back side of it, but the way that the owl's facing, all the geese were right in front of it. That's funny. as I drove by two times this morning. I'm like, oh my gosh! Like, that's anyway. hilarious. Yeah. <sighs> well, so let's let's get into the the meat and taters of this week's show. Um, as we mentioned, we've got Don Curry joining us to talk some shotgunning this week. But before we do that, we're fortunate enough to have. Barton Ramsey back with us this week with another Yukonuba tip of the episode. So let's go ahead and roll that right now, and we'll catch you on the other side. Hey guys, this is Barton Ramsey from Cornerstone Gundog Academy, and this is your Retriever Training Tip of the Episode, brought to you by Yukonuba. I actually want to talk a little bit about nutrition and dog food today. We get the question a lot, what should I give my dog during the hunting season Uh, extra or in addition or as a supplement to its dog food. And so our recommendation is not any sort of 
particular supplement. There's not like a, a protein bar. I mean, there's lots of companies that make that sort of thing. But we believe that a quality dog kibble, such as Yukonuba, which is what we feed at my kennel, at Southern Oak Kennels, uh, we believe that, that a quality dog food is all that your dog needs. What you need to pay attention to is their col- uh, their caloric intake and then how much exercise they're getting. And so those two things will correspond. And so if you have a dog who is hunting, particularly a dog who's working in cold water, they're going to be burning a lot more calories than they are on the days where you're just training and running around the kennel for a little bit or maybe taking them on a walk a few times. And so you're going to want to be mindful of that. And what you have to do is be careful not to add so much additional food to just one feeding per day because that can upset a dog's stomach and their digestive system can get all out of sorts. You also never want to hunt a dog who's just eaten. So you have to be careful during hunting season to recognize the times when you're going hunting. Let's just say you're going out at first light and you're going to hunt. What I'll likely do is feed the dog just after the hunt. Once they've had time to calm down, settle down, stop exercising, they're breathing at a normal rate, I'll give the dog one, one and a half cups of food. And then in the evening, I'll give the dog their normal daily ration of food, whether it's two and a half or three and a half cups, depending on the size of the dog. And so I'm adding an extra half a cup to a cup and a half, depending on which dog it is. And you'll learn your dog over time and you'll understand your dog's needs. And you just want to watch them to see how's their energy level. Are they losing weight? Are they getting overweight? Are they Uh, getting tired too quickly in the field or quicker than you expect them to be. And you want to adjust that way accordingly so that your dog can maintain the same weight, the same energy, the same drive and focus throughout the season. And so we don't recommend anything extra. I definitely don't recommend giving your dog whatever snacks it is that you're cooking up for you and your buddies in the blind. Stick with kibble. It's designed for your dog. Uh, for their good and for their benefit. Uh, Trust your dog food and perhaps bump up the ration just a little bit during the season to make sure they keep that healthy weight on. All right. Thank you to Barton and thank you to Yukonuba for another great tip. You know, this one comes up a lot, uh, you know, particularly in season as far as how much to feed and doing the right nutrition. And, um, you know, we've had a lot of folks in here uh, in our listeners group and on, you know, associated with the show talking about using products, you know, for example, um, like alpha dog nutrition products and things like that. Um, You know, I I defer to people that are more involved in this area than, than me on what's best. But I think regardless of your approach, uh, the foundation of using a quality dog food is, is the critical step. You know, the other things, that you can add in if your dog needs it during season or if you're in particularly cold conditions or whatever it is, if you wanted to use that stuff, you know, that's all good. But I think at the, at the very core, you have to have a quality, um, you know, quality base. It's like, you can't roll out of bed eating honey buns and stuff like that. And then, uh, take celery with you to the blind. It's like, you're kind of defeating the purpose if you don't or protein powder, right? <laughs> So, no, so and judgy. you know one thing so that <laughs> uh, one thing he was saying, and it's something that um, I guess I was really lucky with with Kimber, as far as the caloric intake versus the energy output, and when you know even when she started hunting, if she doesn't get a lot of running in, or if she doesn't, you know, if it's not cold out, like that dog is finely tuned just the way she is like her body is and she knows it she will not overeat like i'll put food out and she's not one of those dogs that just goes and hammers the food bowl, right. which a lot of a lot of dogs yep. are so but if she she knows when she needs it and she'll she'll get after it a little bit but there's you know there's times i'm like why aren't you eating i'm like well i guess you haven't done anything for a while you know and and go out and run and she comes back and and gets after it a little bit so um you know, definitely if your dog is out in cold weather, like he was saying, add a little bit. And, and if it's, you know, not needed, then then cut back. So, you know, definitely pay attention to what your dog needs and, and keep them healthy. But yeah, like you said, the foundation of a quality kibble is, is essential in all of that. Yeah. I mean, it's, so it's something that's, you know, if you're not tracking it or you're not paying attention to that stuff, that's a, that's a critical piece and knowing your, 
knowing your dog is important, just like you said. So, um, you know, I think that's something that's a lot of guys that probably do, but if you're not, might you know, might be something you want to think about. So, good stuff from Barton Ramsey yep. and Yukonuba. So, I guess we could go ahead and transition to this week's guest, Don Curry. And, you know, when we started talking about uh, things for the show, you know, we realized we had, we talked a little bit way back about shotgunning a little bit, but not, we've never had like a true industry professional come on. And, right. uh, you know, if you go to Don's website and take a look at his credentials, uh, you know, He's he embodies the industry professional as far as experience and accomplishments. So we thought, who better than to have him come on? And he was uh, thankfully more than willing to join us. He even postponed his dinner delivery for us, uh, which was <laughs> yeah. He's on the road. He's on the road somewhere getting yeah. food service to his yeah. room. So yeah. So uh, let's go ahead and roll that, and we can chat about it uh, when we're done when it's over. So uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and welcome uh, Don Curry to the show. All right, Dan, so it seems like every year at the start of the season, everyone kind of attributes, uh, at least to some extent, that they have to knock the rust off, uh, you know, and, and attribute that to maybe some of the lack of success that they have in the field. And we thought it might be a good idea to bring someone on the show who could give us a little, little more expertise in the area and a little guidance on maybe how our guys can take care of themselves in the offseason and practice and uh basically take that excuse off the table. So we're not going to be knocking any rust off of this year because we're getting uh, some awesome guidance today from Don Curry. Don's with the Academy of Wing and Clay Shooting. He's also the chief instructor for the National Sporting Clays Association. Uh, Don, welcome to the show. Thank you. Glad to be here. You know, I mean, we're excited because uh, we haven't talked a ton uh, on our show about specific shooting tips and techniques and um, all of these kinds of things. So we're excited to pick your brain a little bit. And I touched a little bit about, you know, briefly there as far as um, who you are, but maybe give us a little, a little, uh, a little further explanation or a little more background about you and sort of, uh, you know, what you're into and sort of a little bit of your background in the, in the shooting, the shooting sports and that kind of, that kind of stuff. Sure. Well, like a lot of uh, a lot of folks that uh, are friends of mine as well as acquaintances, we sort of grew up shotgunning and uh, you know in with upland bird uh, hunting uh, quail or um, chucker in the field, uh, as well as duck hunting and uh, you know other types of bird hunting. Uh, lately, uh, with being the the uh, chief instructor of the National Sporting Clay Association. And prior to that, um, I uh, really got enthused about uh, clay clay target sports, uh, was on the competition circuit for a while, really uh, competed heavily for a few years there, uh, but now occupy most of my time uh, teaching others and teaching other instructors how to teach others how to shoot a shotgun well. Uh, at moving targets like birds and clay targets. Uh, the the other um, uh, thing that uh, I did a few years ago was I actually ran a uh, private quail plantation. So I had the opportunity for a solid two years to be teaching almost exclusively um, bird hunters. So uh, not only am I uh, a... Uh, a clay target enthusiast, but I really started out as most of us do uh, with bird hunting and really found a great deal of, of pleasure and still do in, in bird hunting and teaching others how to uh, be more effective in the field. That's awesome. And, you know, before we get into the nuts and bolts of, of why you're on here, tell us a little bit, where did you, where did you grow up duck hunting? What, what was kind of your favorite species to chase there? Well, actually my, uh, my entry into duck hunting was quite late in life. Um, the, uh, the first type of bird hunting that I did was in the quail fields in North Carolina. My, my, uh, mother's side of the family was all from North Carolina and, uh, my cousins would, uh, would take me, uh, quail hunting over dogs, uh, in the Carolinas back when the quail population was still plentiful in, in the Carolinas. Now it's, uh, you know, most most of it is uh, plantation 
uh, put and take uh, quail hunting, and uh, with some wild quail still in uh, the uh, in the Georgia area as well as some out west. Hmm. So, nice. yeah. sorry, Dan, did you have something else? Nope. Good. Okay. Yeah. So, I think um, you know to kind of get the conversation started. Obviously. You spend a lot of time on the gun. You've you've got a lot of experience in a bunch of different shooting environments, birds, clay birds, things of that nature. Um, I'm curious if you have sort of like a a very general um, philosophy when it comes to gunning. Um, you know, it, it seems like you could probably go down a, a you know kind of a a rabbit hole with some of this stuff. But I mean, you're you're spending time teaching people how to teach. So when you're when you're when you're working with those guys, do you have sort of like a general philosophy that you like to go by, or um, you know, kind of what is the foundational basis of your teaching? You know, uh, you know, um, you know, criteria, but you know, the things that you like to focus on when you're when you're when you're instructing others. As I said, I, I teach a lot of uh, I, I teach almost exclusively shotgunners, and I teach exclusively shotgunners that are shooting at moving targets, not stationary targets, and. The biggest fault, uh, and therefore the biggest opportunity, I see with um, shotgun shooters, particularly those novice and beginning shooters, is they don't really understand um, how they're supposed to engage a moving target with a shotgun. Um, Intuitively, most people think that, well, I, I just sort of aim the shotgun just like I would a rifle, and that's absolutely the wrong approach. The right approach is to uh, just like you would in any um, hand-eye coordination sport, such as catching a baseball with uh, a baseball mitt or hitting a baseball with a, uh, a baseball bat or returning a tennis ball with a tennis serve, is uh, our job as a shooter, as a shotgun shooter, sh- engaging a moving target, is simply to feed the brain target information. So I'm looking at the target. I'm not trying to line up the barrel with the target. So the biggest uh, fault I see is shooters trying to aim uh, at the target instead of looking at the target and trusting their hand-eye coordination to bring the gun to the target. Man. Okay, so there's so, there's so many ways that I could go with this from a, a physical or a mental standpoint, but you were saying, I'm just thinking back at baseball and swinging a bat, and they say, you know, once you do something, what is it, 10,000 times, then you become really proficient in it. How much should people practice to where they have enough faith in their, their body and the feel of their gun to where they can, they can do that and feel comfortable? Yeah, I I think that the, uh, it's hard to give a number. Um, but I will tell you that the whole reason, you know, clay target sports evolved was primarily as, as a, um, as a way to practice shotgunning in the off season, uh, when, you know, outside of the bird season. So, um, to give you an exact number would be difficult, but, um, I will tell you that the, 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 uh, object is really as a shotgunner is to try to get to the point where you're looking at the target and you're feeling the point with the lead hand. In other words, um, you're, you're, if uh, you were to point out a bird, for example, in the sky to your buddy or your, your spouse or whomever, um, you point at that bird and you say, Hey, look at that bird. You're not really looking at your finger to make sure it's pointing at the bird. You're just looking at the bird and pointing at, at the bird with your finger. So, but if someone were to look down your finger and you would see, you would notice that the finger is pretty much pointing at the bird. And that's what we do with a shotgun. We don't aim a shotgun. We point a shotgun. So really the proficiency that we need to develop uh, to be an effective bird hunter is to have the hands and eyes work together well, um, and the hands being the prime prime mover of the shotgun. And as a right-handed shooter, we're a left-handed pointer, and a left-handed shooter is a right-handed pointer. So um, the, in getting proficient with a shotgun, we get better and better at looking at a moving object and pointing shotgun with the, uh, the lead hand in order to engage it. Maybe that's why I can't hit anything. Cause I've always point with my right hand, but I'm a right handed shooter. 
Maybe I need to start pointing at <laughs> I need to start pointing at everything with my left hand. I think. That's, no, that's that's exactly right. Right-handed shooters right? are left-handed pointer, and, and vice versa. Huh. So, you know, I, I I always as I'm hearing you talk about this, for me it becomes a very like uh, in my you know in my mind's eye when I've I've had those situations where I like pull up on a duck and I'm swinging through it and I shoot it and it drops and it feels right. Like it's definitely more of like an instinctive reaction versus like a calculated movement that I go through, I guess, if that's a, exactly. uh, a, a right term. Um, so that, that leads me to ask how critical, uh, you know, is, is shotgun fit for a person uh, in allowing them to get to that point where it's instinctual and, could an uh, improper fit on the gun um, prevent them from ever fully getting there, or will it just like slow the progress? Or will you will they learn? You know, will you just inherently kind of compensate? Or um, yeah, and I ask that because so oftentimes I think us as duck hunters, um, we're either purchasing our shotgun based on value and budget because we know we're going to just beat the tar out of it and it's going to go through a lot of abuse, uh, or maybe it's a hand-me-down or something that we were gifted and that kind of thing. Uh, so, you know, it's not like we're buying a custom fit gun all the time. Uh, and of course the amount of clothing that you're wearing between the start of the season and the end of the season varies. So the feel does change kind of throughout the year. Um, you know, how prohibitive can all of that stuff be to getting to that instinctual, you know, re- repetitive feel? Well, th- yeah, it's, it's a great question, and gun fit is hugely important. And when, when, uh, when I'm teaching instructor courses, um, you know, the two biggest things we address with our first-time students is eye dominance and gun fit. So um, to me, th- those are the prerequisites of, of being a good shotgun shooter. So l- let me be more specific. So w- we've got to make sure that, number one, we're shooting a shotgun from the shoulder or from the side of our more dominant eye, okay? So if we're more right eye dominant, we want to be shooting the gun, the shotgun off our right shoulder. And conversely, if we're left eye, more left eye dominant, we want to be shooting the, the shotgun off the left shoulder. Um, and there are a couple of tests that we run as instructors to figure out whether a person is more right or more left eye dominant. The second critical prerequisite is gun fit, as you uh, rightly ask about. And, uh, you know, basically the whole purpose of a gun fit, there, there's two purposes in gun fit. One, we want to have the shooter be comfortable in shooting the gun. So if uh, a shooter is shooting a gun that's too long, let's say you have uh, someone who's 5'8", a standard gun off the shelf runs about 14 and a half inch length of pull, and that's measured between the front edge of the trigger and the back edge of the butt pad, that gun's going to likely be too long for the 5.8 shooter. So uh, that gun needs to be shortened a bit. For someone who's uh, 6.3 or 6.4, for example, that 14 and a half inch length of pull shotgun off the shelf is going to be too short and will need some lengthening. So, um, that needs to be adjusted either by shortening the stock with a wood stock. If you happen to, if, if a shooter happens to buy a synthetic stock, well, that shooter's sort of out of luck. But that's why I always advocate, uh, particularly if a person's uh, shorter than, let's say, six foot or 5'11, to go ahead and buy a shotgun that's got a wood stock without any recoil device on the back because they're much easier to customize. So, I, I, I spoke about the two purposes of gun fit. One is comfort, making sure that um, the gun is of the right length to where the shooter can move the gun around and maneuver it well um, and point it well. If it's too long, it's going to feel like they're swinging a flagpole. Right? If it's too short, uh, they're going to be whipping the gun around, maybe have too much uh, muzzle velocity, too much mu- muzzle speed, um, and it'll feel more like a twig. So you want to have something that's sort of balanced in the middle, um, and there are certain measurements that we look for in terms of having uh, a, a gun that fits well for comfort purposes. And then the other um, the other critical element besides comfort is we're looking for visibility. So uh, it's absolutely critical that when a shooter shoulders a shotgun that they be able to see the target over the shotgun. So um, there are uh, shotguns and shooters that when you put the two together, 
uh, might not even be able to see over the shotgun well. Because uh, when they mount the shotgun, their eye falls below the level of the rib. That's not going to work well because at the end of the shooter's mount, um, essentially the gun will get between the eye and the target and they'll lose the target or lose the bird behind the gun. So, uh, And then there's also an element of gun fit called cast, which is basically um, it has a lot to do with how the shooter's face is shaped in relationship to the gun. So uh, if the eye comes up too far to the left for a right-handed shooter, they'll shoot to the left. Uh, comes up too far to the right for a right-handed shooter, they'll shoot to the right. So um, cast is also important, but the most important element of visibility in gun fit is having the comb high enough so that the shooter can see over the gun. So again, for gun fit, gun fit is really important. Um, you want to have, you want to address comfort and visibility. Um, a lot of the uh, shotguns out there now have either adjustable combs to adjust drop it, comb, and cast, but there are a lot of um, semi-automatic shotguns out there, which a lot of your uh, listeners probably use in, in waterfowling, um, that are adjustable. For instance, uh, the Beretta A400 is a very adjustable um, gun comparatively. It has a set of shims, and you can raise the comb, or you can change cast, uh, and you can also change uh, length of pull with uh, inserts that come along with the gun, just as one example. And there are certainly other examples of, uh, of good hunting shotguns out there that, are, that have some adjustability to them. So you mentioned with cast, you, you would sort of see or feel a, um, you know, it'd be too right or too left. Um, I'm curious about uh, circling back to length of pull because like I'm 6'4", I got long arms. I was given a, a 12, uh, Remington 870 12 gauge synthetic when I was a kid and I shot it for a long time. And that's just all I knew. And I, I knew it was, you know, I just thought that's how it was, right? I didn't know any better. Um, when I bought a new shotgun that had some shims and stuff on the back, like I, I realized that I needed that longer, uh, that longer length mm-hmm. of pull. And the thing that I noticed af- after, and I only noticed this after the fact, um, was that I had a really hard time getting my cheek down on the stock of the Remington because it was so short. And I was kind of like crunched up on the back of the stock, if that's a, a an appropriate way to right. categorize it. But um, so for guys that maybe that's the only gun they've ever shot or they're, you know, whatever. Um, is there anything performance wise that you would see, uh, as a result of either shooting a gun that's got too short of a uh, length of pull or too long, or is it more of a comfort thing that you're, that you're going to really, cause I mean, I know you say you kind of like wave it around, but, um, like if they don't know any different, like how would you be able to gauge that if you've only hunted for three or four years right. and you're hunting with a gun that you're, so, so there, you know, sure. So, so there are some good good publications out there that you can read about gun fit and, and how a gun should uh, properly fit. The most important uh, element of, of uh, evaluating gun fit is to have a proper stance. And what you find with uh, uh, shooters who either don't have a good stance or they're, uh, they're used to shooting a gun that, that doesn't fit them, uh, they tend to have a, a, an improper stance. So you can't really evaluate gun fit well until you have a shooter, um, you know, that has, uh, has a good stance. So, you know, how does it affect, but we talk about two, uh, uh points, let's say of, of where the shot goes, we call that point of impact. And then we talk about point of aim, which is really a bad term, but it's really where you're looking. So the, the whole object of gun fit is to get the gun shooting where you're looking. Okay. So, uh, yes, the element of comfort comes in if you have a gun that's too uh, too short, for example, in an example that you just gave, um, your nose is going to be, um, you know, pressed right up against your, your the knuckle of your your right uh, thumb if you're a right-handed shooter, and that's that's not going to be real comfortable when the gun goes off. You're going to tend to get you know bonked in the in the nose. On the other hand, if uh, you're five eight and have that same length of gun, let's uh, say uh, an average fourteen and a half length of pull. Uh, the gun is not going to feel like you're in control of it. <laughs> you're going to feel like the gun's in control of you. It's just going to feel very awkward to move the gun. And if you if the gun's too awkward to move, obviously you're not going to be as smooth and as efficient to the target as you would be if the gun were a good length. 
And typically what we look for in terms of length of pull is if the shooter's in a good stance and he's got a good, uh, a well-fitting gun, um, the, the, the tip of the nose is going to be approximately two fingers distance from the base knuckle of the trigger hand, okay, of, of the thumb of the trigger hand. So if you can imagine a person mounted to a right-handed shooter mounted to a gun and uh, standing to his right looking at him from the side, we're looking for two fingers between the tip of the nose and um, the base knuckle of the thumb. And, and that represents, in general terms, uh, a well-fitting gun from a length of pull perspective. Interesting. Awesome. Man. A lot of information. So when you're talking about going just real quick, but the cast, like you guys actually will rotate the butt of the gun to get your cast correct. Is that right? No, actually that's a, that's a commonly held misconception. So the uh, cast is affected by um, how far, another word for cast is bend. Okay. If, if you took a shotgun and uh, held it out in front of you, with the, the muzzle pointed up and the butt pad pointed down and and looked at uh, an imaginary line that runs down the center of the rib all the way to the back of the gun, you would see that um, a right-handed gun is bent, the stock is sort of bent to the right. And a left-handed gun, that stock is sort of bent to the left as compared to that center line of the rib. If you ran that that uh, line all the way back in, in sort of an imaginary straight line. So we, uh, again, a right-handed stock is typically bent to the right as you look at the top of the gun, uh, and a left-handed stock is bent to the left. And then we have another um, another measurement that we call toe-in or toe-out, or toe uh, and a right-handed stock is not only bent to the right, but the toe or the bottom of the stock is bent even further to the right to leave room for the pectoral muscle. So we would have toe out if for both a, a right-handed and a left-handed stock. A uh, right-handed uh, stock would be, uh, would, would be bent to the right with the toe of the stock bent even further to the right, and a left-handed stock would be the opposite. Yeah, what, what makes me bring that up... Um trap shooting is starting to actually get into the high schools around this area. And I was, I was hanging out with, uh, I was actually taking some senior pictures and the kid had his trap gun and the, the butt of the gun just looked like it was rotated. And I was like, man, did you bang that off something or, but I guess that's just how it fit him. So he, you know, that's kind of the style that they're going with. But, um, I wanted to circle back, you know, one of the things you said was that the eye dominance was very important. And I wonder if you have a lot of guys that shoot with both eyes open, is that a thing that you teach or is it kind of against the, the thought process? Okay. So the, 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 the commonly held belief is that, and, and it is true that it is, it is always best to shoot with two eyes open uh, because by closing one eye uh, or winking one eye, you're essentially depriving your brain of, of very important um, visual information. I mean, shooting a shotgun is all about um, capturing and processing visual information. So both eyes open, uh, capturing as much visual information as you can about the target. However, um, there are some people who don't have, they are not solidly left eye dominant or solidly right eye dominant. They're somewhere in between. Uh, they may have what we call uh, some center ocular uh, center ocular dominance, or they may be center ocular, or they may be more right or more left, but have uh, some center, what we call center shift. So, um, and that might affect them on certain targets, but not all targets. So, uh, at at that point, it's it's really hard to um, describe a lot of this over, you know, over the, uh, you know, on the air. Because it's a very it's a very visual exercise, and we spend quite a bit of time in the instructor course um, helping instructors understand how to assess a student's eye dominance, and then uh, help them either shoot with both eyes open or uh, develop some way to compensate for any kind of um, 
uh, eye dominance issues that might affect their mm-hmm. shooting. You know, that, that actually makes me wonder too. Um, you know, you're working with, you know, people that are going to be instructors and, you know, a lot of times, you know, um, people get, I don't know. I mean, it's not uh, purposely done, but like so a lot of times, you know, bad information will get put out there and it'll be, you know, uh, taught on and on and on as, as, as gospel. And it's, and it's not great information for whatever reason. Um, you know, Dan and I were both baseball players and I, you know, you see it in today where when we were growing up, we were taught certain techniques and everyone taught them. And then now that, you know, uh, analytics and the science of, of the sport has advanced, they realize that's not really what you want to be teaching. Like you want to be teaching other things, um, for these reasons. Mm -hmm. Are there things in the, in the shotgunning world that perhaps, you know, our dads might've told us or our grandpas might've told us, or you're seeing instructors telling other, uh, folks that have you know, for years or whatever been held as, as good thought process and has changed because now we just have more information and we can be more informed and uh, you know, and things of that, and there, and there may not be something, but I just want to make sure that if there, if there is something like out there, like that out there that we, you know, we make sure we get the, the best information out there possible. So is there anything you can think of? Yeah. Would be I, like, you know, that's, yeah, abs- absolutely. <laughs> um, I, I figured it. You know, one of them, <laughs> one of them is that we mount, that we should always mount to the shoulder. Um, you know, our shoulder really is irrelevant when it comes to where the shot's going to go. What's, what is relevant is where the comb or the top of the stock is uh, in relationship to the cheek. So if the stock is, so essentially we shouldn't be mounted to the shoulder, we should be mounted to the cheek. And if our gun is, uh, it fits reasonably well, um, then, um, you know, our gun will move to the cheek and that's going to determine uh, where the shot pattern goes. Um, so over and, you know, for the most common, uh, I think, uh, misnomer is that we should be mounting a shotgun to the shoulder. That's just incorrect. We should be mounting it to the cheek. It's the relationship between the comb and the cheek or the, the, the rib line and the cheek, uh, that, de- that determines if the gun is, is shooting where you're, where you're looking. The other, I, I would say the other misnomer is the whole discussion about lead. <laughs> so, um, you know, just like in, um, you know, in, in hitting a baseball with a baseball bat or catching a baseball with a baseball mitt or hitting a tennis ball with a tennis racket, uh, we're not looking at the, uh, the tool that we're intercepting the moving target with. We're looking at the moving target. And that's exactly what we, we should be doing. Uh, when we're engaging a moving target, such as a bird or a clay target. What ends up happening, though, is particularly in clay target sports, we are talking about lead. You know, how, how many feet in front were you? And what happens there for the shooter to, uh, first of all, and we all see lead differently. So for if we're, if we're on a sporting clay course, for example, and you ask me, well, how much lead did you give that? And I tell you two feet. Um, your two feet may be different than my two feet based on how you, you see the target and how your brain processes um, that target information. The, the other thing, the other really dangerous thing that that does as far as team performance is that gets you not looking at the target, but that gets you looking at the gap between the target and the barrel. And it's a physiological impossibility for us to focus on two objects at different distances clearly. In order to uh, see two targets at different distances, we need to soften our focus on both of them so that our eyes are trained somewhere in between those two objects. So essentially what we're doing by checking the lead on a shot, so if we're engaging, let's say, a crossing duck in the blind, and we're not looking exclusively at the duck, we're actually looking at the gap between the duck and the muzzle, um, we're not doing our job as a shooter, which is to feed the brain the best high definition target information we possibly can. So this whole essential, this, this whole idea of consciously establishing lead is just a misnomer and gets people missing behind, slowing their gun down, stopping their gun in a lot of cases. Um, you know, back in, uh, 1925 and again in 1953, uh, a guy by the name of Robert Churchill, an Englishman, uh, and a big 
you know, game shooter, um, was the first one to talk about um, hand-eye coordination as the key to good shot gunning. So contrary to popular belief, there's not this magical formula of lead uh, between the barrel and the target and the relationship between the two. What we need to do, and then this is what Churchill said uh, in those two, and the two books that he wrote on those two dates that I mentioned, is that if we put 100% of our visual concentration on the target being intercepted, the natural overthrow of the gun will establish the forward wells. So those, I would say, would be the two biggest misnomers or uh, wives' tales. Uh, another one might be checking the gun fit by the length of the arm between the elbow and the end of the fingers. Uh, that's another uh, one that we gun fitters um, uh, run into all the time that's just incorrect. And that takes me, well, the first part of that makes me think, you know, you're, I've been checking out your website, doncurry.com, and there's a lot of great information on there. And kind of, it seems like your process is the focus, movement, and faith. And the one thing that your, the video on there said, you know, having faith in your shot and, and just, like you said, visually focusing on the target and something that caught me by surprise, I forget what the percentage was, but it was the last two tenths of a second is when, I don't know if it was 90% of the misses occur because people were checking their the end of their barrel instead of having faith in in their ability to to shoot the the target. Exactly. Yeah, what what typically happens is um, that you know, it, it, let's say uh, again, we'll use that same um duck coming across our blind. We're looking at we're looking at the head of the duck. We've got good focus on the duck. We're 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 starting to mount and move our gun to the target. And then just at the last minute, before we pull the trigger, we soften our focus on the duck and we check the barrel target relationship or check the lead. Okay. Um and and what happens when you visually soften your uh focus on the target is the shotgun will slow down or stop. And, you know, I can tell you, I've stood behind, you know, thousands of students over, you know, tens of thousands of hours. And uh, every time a student uh, softens their focus on a moving target with a shotgun to check the lead, the gun either stops or slows down and the miss is behind. So what's your what's your immediate reaction when you when you see your student doing that? What do you say to them? Stop looking at the barrel. <laughs> Stop thinking. So, what part of that bird were you looking at when you pulled the trigger? <laughs> and and if the answer is well, uh, you know, I I don't know, or uh, you know, I I don't know that I was looking at the bird as I pulled the trigger because uh, so to have acute focus on the target, uh, we need to not especially a, a duck's got a lot of real estate. It's a pretty big object, right? So we want to try to focus on the head of that, uh, of that bird as we're pulling the trigger. So if I can tell you, having stood again, stood behind a lot of students that, uh, if their focus is exclusively on the target, as they pull the trigger, they will have good visual follow through and therefore they'll have good physical follow through. So that gun will continue to move with the target. If they have good visual follow through on the target. Hmm. Okay. So, you know, I, I, I want to ask you one other thing here, and I know we're getting close to time, but uh, for me, one of the big things that we always come back to as far as waterfowling and shotguns is uh, the size of load that guys shoot, you know, three and a half versus three inches, kind of the, mm -hmm. big, the big debate in our space, right? And it's like mm -hmm. uh, various schools of thought and things like that. Um, the one thing that the, that the scientific data does bear out is that, um, you know, there's absolute truth that if you shoot a three and a half compared to a three inch shell, uh, the felt recoil is higher. Um, in your experience, and I ask you this because I'm looking through your website and I've seen you've worked with not only, uh, you know, like world-class shotgunners in R1 yourself, but also, you know, uh, working with you know, army infantry and ranger schools and things of that nature. So you've seen other uh, platforms of different sizes and calibers. Um, in your opinion, how much does felt recoil impact accuracy, if at all? Well, 
you know, um, self recall is, is there's an issue of comfort. There, there's two issues with there's two issues with self recoil. One is comfort. Obviously, if it's if it's really spent, the gun's really spanking you hard. Um, it's not going to be a whole lot of fun. Plus, right. <laughs> um, you're going to have you're not going to have as good recovery for your second shot. Right. So your 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 likelihood of getting a double with a gun that's got a lot of kick versus a gun that doesn't have as much kick um, is going to be you know less. But I, let me let me sort of change the question a little bit because I I get this question a lot is you know and really the the question you're getting to is the argument between three and three and a half, you know, how much lead do I really need in the air <laughs> to, to, to kill the, to kill the bird. Right? right. So let me digress a second and say that there's, there's a big difference between felt recoil and actual recoil. So actual recoil is basically kinetics. Okay. So if you have the same weight gun, uh, the same load, um, the only things you can do to really affect that, kinetic recoil, the actual recoil, is you can change the weight of the gun. So a heavier gun is going to have less recoil because it takes more energy to move it. Okay. Yep. Um, second thing you can do is you can change your load. Okay. Um, so in terms of actual recoil, those are the only two things you can really do to change actual recoil. To change felt recoil, felt recoil is a different story. So if you have an over and under shotgun, for example, and you have the same weight, theoretically the same weight over and under shotgun, and you have the, the, sa- uh, the same as a semi-automatic shotgun, you have the same load, theoretically those two guns are going to have the same amount of actual or physical recoil, but they're going to have a different amount of felt recoil. And the reason that the semi-automatic has less felt recoil is because the device in it, whether it's a gas operated or recoil operated, spreads the recoil out. Does that make sense? So you, you're not actually reducing the, the, the physical recoil. You're, you're spreading the recoil out so it doesn't feel like as much. Right. So, um, you know, I, I guess getting back to the original question and, 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 and away from this whole felt versus actual recoil, I personally don't believe that you need a three and a half um, versus a three to knock down a bird. Um, you know, in, in sporting clays, I've been using a one ounce load, even though you're allowed to use a one and an eighth ounce load for a 12 gauge shotgun um, for almost as long as I've been competing. And uh, I, I just think our, our time's better spent looking at the looking at the uh, the bird than it is figuring out which which load we're going to use and I do think that, um, you know, when you're using a, you know, a uh, really, really powerful shell, like a three and a half versus a three, it takes more powder uh, to move a three and a half inch shell at the same speed as a three inch shell. So therefore, you're going to be getting a lot more recoil. So I I tend to opt for uh, a lesser load and I focus more on the speed of the shell than than the uh, the amount of lead in the in the shell. That all makes sense. Um, I know, like Josh said, you know, you, you had some room service come in, and you're getting ready to eat. So I got one last question for you, and it's kind of um, Josh's son made it out to the blind with us a few times, and Josh took him out, and I got kids coming up. Um, what kind of advice do you give our listeners with kids that? are going to be getting into the sport and, and gunning and, you know, where should we start? What are some things that we can focus on to, to help them be successful? I guess I'd, I'd say four or five things. Um, number one, don't get them into the, into shotgunning too early. The, um, what I found is that kids between kids younger than 11, uh, really, in my opinion, uh, shouldn't be shooting a shotgun uh, because it's just too much for them, number one. There's not a shotgun you're going to find that's going to fit most kids under 11. And it it causes a whole bunch of bad habits that are really hard to reverse uh, once they do get uh, to be, you know, 15, 16 years old and, and able to shoulder a shotgun well. So I would I would just strongly recommend, as much as a father wants to get a son uh, hunting alongside them, uh, and believe I believe me, I understand that emotion. Um, they're they're best not to get 
that kid shooting a shotgun too early. Uh, keep them on the BB gun because the, the BB gun, um, you know, and, and, and using creative targets uh, in your backyard or out in the field uh, is a really good way to develop the same um, hand-eye coordination uh, that you need for shotgunning. And when they do are big enough to hold a shotgun and they convert over to a shotgun, um, that time they spend on a BB gun is going to be well spent. The second thing I would say is make sure you understand their eye dominance, which, which can change uh, during puberty. So make sure you understand what their eye dominant status is and make sure they're sitting on the correct side, so the side of their more dominant eye. Third, I would say make sure that they have a gun that fits well. Um, so that means that it's not too long for them. And that's typically the problem we have with ladies and kids is, um, they're given a gun by someone off the shelf. The gun's too long for them. They end up leaning back, um, and developing some really bad, uh, habits. And also when a gun is, is too long for a shooter and that shooter leans back, they're going to feel recoil to a much greater extent than someone who's shooting with a shotgun that fits them well. And also because kids' facial structure is, you know, smaller than an adult, um, and many times that ill-fitting shotgun um, is not going to be uh, such that they can see the target over the gun. So they may need to raise that comb a little bit. If they can't see the target over the gun, they're not going to be very successful. They're going to get discouraged pretty quickly. And, um, you know, we, we want them to see the targets and we want them to hit targets. So I would say those would be the big thing, things that I see in uh, getting kids into uh, into shotgun. Yeah, that's a uh, that's interesting to hear your take on that. There's, uh, I mean, obviously we both got kids, Dan and I, uh, but you know we've got a lot of our listeners that ask questions about their kids and getting them into it and all that kind of stuff. So uh, a lot of great advice there, and um, yeah, a lot of chew, lot to chew on, and. Um, you know, I think that as I'm as we're talking here, I, I mean, I've just totally enjoyed this conversation, and uh, I've been thumbing through your website uh, during our our chat. So uh, I would definitely encourage anyone to check your website out, doncurry.com. There's there's a ton of resources on here. Um, you know, there's things on here about gun fittings and um, different learning libraries and things like that. So just a really cool uh, spot to come and check some stuff out. And, um, you know, Don, we appreciate you giving us some time here this evening. We apologize for just uh, interrupting your dinner. But um, we, <laughs> no, not at all. We, we covered a ton of great stuff here uh, tonight. And um, I don't know if you're on uh, social media or any of that kind of stuff, but, you know, Go ahead and you know plug uh, wherever wherever else uh, people can track you down other than uh, you know doncurry dot com. Yeah, I think doncurry dot com is probably the best place to go. The other thing I would encourage people to do, and this is going to be a shameless marketing plug, but uh, but but really and truly, I refer a lot of my students um, to my book called Mastering Sporting Clays um, that came out last year, and then I've got two DVDs out. But for your listeners, I would recommend the uh, first DVD, which came out in two thousand twelve and really received rave reviews, and it's called Focus, Movement, Faith. And uh, I would say both of those tools would be great tools for uh, waterfowlers as well as uh, beginning clay shooters. Awesome. Definitely you can head over to doncurry.com, and I'm looking at it right now. You can get all those items in the store. And, uh, Don, again, we appreciate your time this evening, and uh, definitely a lot of great information for our waterfowling audience. So uh, thanks again, and um, – you know, we look forward to maybe t- catching up with you again someday down the road. Great. Thank you, fellas. All right. Thanks again to uh, Don for joining us. And I think that interview had a lot of really great information uh, in it. It was definitely one that we probably could have spent a long time talking about. Uh, going deep dive on certain things and techniques and philosophies and all of that kind of stuff. But we wanted to keep it kind of, um, you know, not high level, but we wanted to keep it and hit a couple, uh, you know, a lot of different areas uh, without dragging it out too long. So hopefully you all found that informative and I can only speak for me. I, you know, I enjoyed, I enjoyed that conversation and I definitely learned uh, a lot. And I think, 
you know, particularly when it comes to shotgun fit, Dan, you know, I shot that Remington 870 that I, I was given that when I was 12 years old. And I shot that thing till I was probably into my mid to late twenties. Um, you know, so I always felt like it was hard for me to get my cheek onto the comb properly. And, you know, I, I definitely, when I, when I got a new gun, I realized I needed a little bit longer pull, give me a little more room like he was talking about. Um, but the other thing that probably resonated with me from that more than anything is, you know, how oftentimes have we been told to shoulder the gun, you know, shoulder your gun, you know, this, that, and the other. And, you know, it's like shoulder your gun and get your cheek down. And, you know, his, you know, his philosophy is, you know, get, you know, for lack of a better term, shoulder it air quotes here, shoulder it to your cheek, uh, which is the critical piece right. of it, which um, I'm so guilty of not getting it, my cheek on there properly. And that's probably, a majority of my misses are are due to that in some form or fashion. Yeah, it was a great conversation. You know, when we were looking for someone to cover this topic, I I looked at a ton of Olympic shooters and you know well known people that are good shots and stuff. But you know the the best way to master something, the best way to learn it is teach it, right? So all those all those Olympic shooters have teachers and this guy is, is one of those teachers. So, uh, definitely a wealth of knowledge and I'm, I'm glad that he was willing to come on, but yeah, you know, like w- what you were saying when you were, when you were 12, you were probably six, four. So that gun was probably too small for you to start <laughs> out and definitely, <laughs> definitely a lot of adjustments, uh, that could have been made, but man, some of the things I didn't realize, like eye dominance can change during puberty yeah. is one comment he made. Yeah. Uh, definitely didn't know that. So just a lot of things to think of. And it's funny because as he was talking, I was thinking about some of my, I don't want to say best shots, but some of, some of the ones that felt the best are almost ones that I don't remember thinking about. Yeah, right. For sure. And that's, ex- that's, a ex- that's exactly what he was saying. Like, so everything is, you have to have faith in, in your body and essentially, you know, the gun is, is you pointing really. Right. So I don't know, just so many, so many things to think about. And it's funny cause when, you know, I talked about that, um, when I was out in Oklahoma mm-hmm. and shooting the, the Benelli, like I kept thinking about where to put the gun and where to put that beat at. And I was struggling. And, you know, when I have my own gun that I'm comfortable with, you know, it's, it's not even a thought. So, um, a lot made sense and, and it was just good to hear, hear him confirm some of those things. But yeah, the dude, I mean, he knows what he's talking about and I hope people go at least go to his website and see all his accomplishments and, and everything that he's into. Cause uh, you know, he, he, he knows his stuff. No doubt. And I, again, that was one, one of the more informative ones for me most that we've had most recently. And I think it's not only in, in not only um, because of the information and, in, in, uh, Don's ability to, to synthesize that to us, but also, you know, just the fact that this is one area that we have not done a ton of discussion on. So it was great to hear right. a true professional's opinion and thoughts on this. And I found it particularly interesting, his thoughts on uh, kids getting involved. You know, I know we got a lot of guys that have, kids under the age of 11 shooting right now and and um i was interested you know i thought his take on that was very interesting and i'm sure there's probably some people out there listening to this that may or may not agree with that um but it's interesting to hear you know, his professional opinion and just something to kind of consider if you've got the young one that's sort of uh you know you're not really sure so something to keep him yeah and you know the keeping a bb gun or even a 22 i should ask him kind of what he thought about like starting out with a 410 you know, even a some some nine ten year olds are a lot bigger than others, and they might be able to handle that a little better. So, yeah, you know. But it also makes me think: is that why a lot of hunting ages used to be twelve years old before you can go out and hunt, just because it's you're more comfortable with the weapon that you're using? I don't know. Just a lot of a lot of random Fair thoughts. Uh, we're I don't going. Have the answer. We're going through my head. <laughs> Well, uh, but yeah, definitely. I enjoyed that a lot. Likewise. So thanks again to Don. We do appreciate it. And what do you think? You got one last thing you want to hit me with before we 
put a bow on this week's episode? Um, yeah, I was, uh, I was doing something in the garage the other day and pretty much the entire time I was laughing because I thought I'd bring it up on a show, but it doesn't happen very often, but I cleaned out my truck and the entire time I, I'm just laughing because I could see you like standing behind me just going, man, that thing is such a locker. That's <laughs> such a locker. I could just imagine you standing there behind me. So it's funny. Got a little spring cleaning in and, uh, yeah, man, you know, baseball starting up. Yeah. Uh, yeah. March, March madness. I already got one, one loss on the table and, Probably not going to win the the million dollar pool, so hmm. unfortunate. Well, yeah, you can't win them all, Dan. So on that note, can't win them all. And, can't uh, win them all. Let's go ahead and knock this week out. Uh, before we do, again, want to just thank Cornerstone Gun Dog Academy, the world's most comprehensive online gun dog training resource. They've got over one hundred and sixty instructional videos. It's basically everything you need to take a seven week old puppy to a finished gun dog. Check out cornerstonegundogacademy.com. Sign up for the free preview module and begin your your training journey today. Cornerstone Gun Dog Academy is the the world's most advanced gun dog training resource on the web. Uh, Also, they're a great Instagram follow if you haven't uh, checked them out. There are lots of great content that they put out through the social media platform, so check them out as well. Also, thank you to Gunner Kennels and 737 Duck and Goose Calls for their support of this week's episode. And again, uh, we say it all the time, but you know, Please consider supporting the companies that support us as they make all of this possible. So thank you again to all of them. All right, that does it for episode 127. Hopefully you enjoyed our discussion with Don Curry about shotgunning and hopefully you picked up a tip or two that will make you a better gunner. If you're new to the show, head over to iTunes, catch up on all the past episodes and leave us a five-star rating and review. It'll help other hunters just like you find our show. We're kind of in the off season here. Hopefully episodes like this will help get you through and give you something to build off of through the summertime. So we'll keep this type of stuff coming. So for Dan, I'm Josh. Till next week, take care. <laughs>